Welcome back to part two of Hebrews chapter 11, where we've been seeing how faith formed the bedrock of the lives of the Old Testament patriarchs. They understood who God was and responded to him in action, whether that was Abraham leaving his home and wandering like a foreigner in the land that was supposed to be his, or Isaac and Jacob passing on those promises to the next generations, or Joseph instructing his bones to be buried in the same land that still wasn't theirs. Even though they didn't see God's promises fulfilled in their lifetimes, they knew that they would be. They still had faith that God would be faithful to them, and they were willing to be part of God's bigger plan for his people. From the patriarchs, we head into Exodus and the story of Moses, starting at verse 23. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. By faith the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Moses, of course, we've already met in chapter 3, where he was compared to Jesus. Moses is probably the most significant person in the Old Testament, bringing the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and bringing them the law as God's special people. He was great, but not as great as Jesus, to whom he was pointing. We see here the attitude of faith and fearlessness that dominated his life. His parents trusted God's plan and hid him, even though the Pharaoh was going around killing babies and mistreating all the Israelites. Moses himself chose to identify as a member of God's people, rather than run away to the comfort of the Egyptian palace. And he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He knew that God had something special in store for his people, and he had a personal relationship and encounter with the God of the promises made to his ancestors that drove him forwards. This is a massively encouraging inspiration to the readers that Moses, this great leader, showed faith in the face of danger and persevered despite opposition from those around him. Moses and the Israelites together trusted that what God had said to Moses about sparing their firstborn if they followed the Passover rules. And this was a real moment of truth for them. God had promised to save their firstborn, so they had to trust that he was faithful to his word. Moses also had to trust that God was the God of keeping promises and to pass faithfully that word on to the people, to give them all a combined hope and faith. We followed the Israelites from there to the Red Sea, where again faith and perseverance were essential. If they turned back, then they would be captured or killed by their enemies. They had to trust that God would act for them, even to do the impossible, and save them. But they could trust God. Because even if the Israelites couldn't remember the history of their ancestors, God had done amazing things for them in their own experience. They could have faith in God because he had shown who he was by what he did and proved himself to be trustworthy and supremely powerful. From here, the Israelites moved into the desert. But there's not much to say there about their faith other than what we read about in Hebrews 3, 15 to 19. Hint, it's not great. The biggest challenge when they actually entered the Promised Land was the massive fort of Jericho, which we read about in Joshua chapter 6. Now, how would you attack a fort? Probably with some siege equipment, I imagine, or you'd starve them out, or you'd use some similar tried and true tactic. Probably one of the least effective means is to walk around it for a week and blow some trumpets. But again, the people had faith that God will do what he said and deliver the land to them, to fulfill the promises that he made to Abraham so many generations before. They weren't there to hear those promises made, but they could see God making them happen. 
And finally, this section ends with the story of Rahab, who has the Israelite spies who had come into the Promised Land risked her life by tricking the people looking for them. She wasn't even part of the Israelite nation. She wasn't a physical heir to these Abrahamic promises, but she was an heir by Abrahamic faith. She had heard all about God and what he had done for his people, and she trusted that a God who could save people so remarkably and give them victory so remarkably was a powerful God that she could put her faith in and also be saved, even though she wasn't an Israelite herself. That hope of salvation came also through her trust in the people of God that she met, that they were indeed reflective of God's faithfulness. As we've, or, as we've already seen in Hebrews, for both faith and priesthood, it's not physical descent that's important. And of course, there are then so many more examples in the Old Testament that we have for inspiration as our writer to the, as our author of Hebrews tells us, starting at verse 32 again. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning, they were sword in two, they were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes and in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. The Old Testament is full of people of faith who did amazing things. Well, to be more precise, people who trusted God and whom God used to do amazing things both ordinary cool things like administering justice and miraculous cool things like raising the dead to life. But it is also full of people of faith who had terrible things happen to them, who were killed, impoverished and mistreated, who wandered without a home. But they were not any the less people of faith. Verse 39 tells us these were all commended for their faith. They succeeded and failed, sometimes both, but those earthly successes and failures were not what defined them or their lives. Faith did. Their certain hope in God's promises, even though they knew it wouldn't happen in their lifetimes. God had something better planned. And that better plan, as we've been learning this whole time, is Christ. That's why only together with us would they be made perfect. Remember, perfect means that it has all the essential ingredients to do what it was designed to do, to be complete. What was lacking for the faith of these people from the Old Testament was a specific end point, the culmination of the hope that they had, the fulfillment of those promises that God had made so long ago. And that fulfillment is not without us because we are also caught up in those promises as the heirs of Abraham's faith the all nations that are blessed through him. We are part of the whole story of the Bible, from creation through to Christ and beyond. Therefore, our author continues into chapter 12, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This is the icing on the cake. For these Jewish Christians, the temptation to fall back into Judaism would be a rejection of the very faith that the great heroes of the Old Testament had. They testify to God's amazing faithfulness and power and point inexorably towards Christ. 
It's like, like they're cheering us onwards as we're running our race, focused forwards rather than backwards, whether our course ahead may be difficult or smooth. Although all the people mentioned in chapter 11 are great inspirations, they're only pointing to the one we should really be basing our lives on, Jesus. He is the pioneer and perfecter of faith, the one who gives us faith in the first place, who leads us forward in faith and gives our faith its true meaning and purpose. And if even he willingly suffered for us to bring us salvation and to be our perfect high priest, then we should not be discouraged when suffering happens to us as well. We want to be able to say, like Paul at the end of 2 Timothy, I've fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but to also all who have longed for his appearing. And with that, our series on Hebrews comes to a close. I hope it's been as interesting for you as it has been for me. Please leave a comment below or email me and share what has been the biggest discovery that you've made as we've gone through the book. What has been the most interesting or most transformative thing that God has shown to you through his word. And this also brings to an end all our time together. Now I've got to say it's been a pleasure and a privilege. I wish you all the best in your future studies and your future ministries. May you, as heirs of Abraham's faith, be blessed and be a blessing to everyone. I pray that out of God's glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.